can't think of any writer who is actually comfortable talking about their work uh, because we assume that our work would speak for itself. Uh, but in certain situations such as this where I'm a playwright, uh, so my work may not be as accessible as say a novelist's work would be because we have all the constraints of uh, dramatic production. A play lives in its stage performance. A play is written not primarily to be read. I know some of you may be studying plays which is fine, but also keep in mind that the play is written primarily for the stage. So, you put it on page because it needs to live and breathe on stage. That is extremely important and that may be a, re a reason why many people have not seen uh, uh, any of my plays and productions and may still be studying them in classrooms, which I think is a trend that needs to change. And you don't really need very big productions uh, to bring about this change. It could be in the classroom itself and you don't need uh, uh, you know professional actors or maybe it, you could sort of team up with your theatre department, get some of the actors to come into the classroom pick up the books, whatever play, it need not be mine even if you are studying Shakespeare. The best way to understand Shakespeare is in performance uh, because you may you know learn about the iambic pentameter and you can learn about you know the sonnet form and the you know the, uh, the way the rhymes are worked out etc. But unless you hear them and unless you have these scenes enacted in front of you, you will miss out on the genius of Shakespeare, right. So, I would say I would highly recommend that if it is possible for classrooms to either bring in the actors from the theatre department or use volunteers, it is great fun just allotting parts and reading out different uh, uh, characters and suddenly you will realize that why the playwright has chosen certain words, why is there this instruction uh, written in, in, the, in, in the script, uh, because that has a reason that will, can only be fully understood when the play is uh, played out, right. So, uh, I will briefly uh, uh, start by asking uh, like the FAQs. So, I am just going by the frequently asked questions from different uh, talks as to, uh, so the top most on the list are why plays and why not novels. And then the second uh, 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 in popularity is why in English and why not in any other languages. So, I could talk about these two questions, they are fairly uh, sort of uh, you know they have been sort of answered quite often. Uh, the first one is that why plays and not a novel, because as a playwright, I am interested, my primary interest is drama. I write because I am interested in the theatre, it is not the other way around. Then I did not suddenly decide I want to be a writer and shall I write a play or shall I write a novel or shall I uh, 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 write poetry. And of course, the uh, common assumption being poetry is easy to write because it is short and it could be 4 lines or 17 syllables or whatever and so it is easy. Actually, that is probably the hardest form to, uh, uh, to write in. I remember a writer said, uh, wrote a very long letter to his friend and at the end of it he said, P.S. Excuse me, I am terribly sorry, but I do not have the time to write you a short letter, right. So, brevity requires great deal of thought. You know, you could say something so simple, but there has to be a great deal of complex thinking to bring it to that ease, right. Now, coming to what I was talking about, why plays and why not novels, is that I began writing to supplement content in the kind of theatre I was doing, right. Now, uh, let me simplify that, is that I was, when I started off in the theatre, I was directing, again I am a victim of uh, uh, you know maybe some of you are victims like me as well, is that very earlier on uh, I received uh, an education in English. Uh, you, you know my parents were from Gujarat and they migrated to, uh, uh, to Bangalore and uh, they put us, my sisters and I in what they considered the best schools. 
and best in quotes meaning English medium schools right. Now, these are assumptions and these are grave mistakes and I will uh, advise you not to put your children in English medium schools. Um, it sort of breaks you completely from your roots right. I forgot Gujarati because for me Gujarati was the language of my parents and they were from the past right and English was the language of the present because I was conversing in English in school. In fact, we were punished for not speak uh, for speaking in any other language apart from English. Uh, so, that seemed to be the language which we were encouraged to speak in and plus that was the language which came with a certain premium in society that if you spoke English well, then you belonged to an urban society. Uh, in, in that sense. So, that is how I began um, thinking in English right. So, my interest in theatre and the fact that I operated in English uh, because that was my education both seemed to have a, a kind of conflict uh, because theatre when I was growing up in the 80s uh, Indian English theatre did not have any presence. It is not that I did not have predecessors uh, uh, you know uh, you have playwrights like Patap Sharma, Asif Karimboy and many others who wrote uh, very prolifically in uh, Indian English for the theatre, but these were not available to us at that time. Remember this was the age before the inter not only the internet before computers uh, and uh, can you imagine I grew up without a cell phone that is how deprived my generation was. So, uh, where was I? Yes, so this seemed to be uh, there seemed to be a conflict uh, over there, but at that time I did not know there was a conflict because I did not understand the politics of English, I did not understand the politics of doing Indian uh, uh, theatre in English, I did not even think of my theatre as Indian, it was theatre you know and I am Indian, so it was Indian theatre. So, when I decided to try my hand at writing because the kind of work I was doing earlier was uh, were things like uh, you know Euripides, I did a very very bad production of Hippolytus, very pretentious uh, pretending to be intellectual and so then you do a Greek uh, tragedy. And uh, then I did um, uh, an American play, a Neil Simon play again that seemed to be uh, a very hip and trendy thing to do then in English language theatre. But very soon I realized that this, this did not give me the kind of satisfaction I was looking at, especially when I visited Bombay and saw a couple of uh, plays in Hindi and in Gujarati and realized that the audiences for these plays would applaud at a line or would be so caught up in a scene and when a scene was enacted with great uh, uh, you, you know with uh, with uh, great emotion spilling out uh, you know very truthfully from the actors the audiences would just spontaneously give their applause this was not planned and now this never happened in the kind of theatre I was doing because it just did not mean anything to anyone. I do not think it meant anything to me and I do not think it meant anything to my audiences right. That is when I thought why not try my hand at writing original plays. So, that is when I uh, began writing uh, the very first play I wrote uh, where there is a will. I wrote uh, about a dozen pages and uh, called my actor friends and said look you know <coughs> let us see why do not you read this just for a lark and tell me you know what you think of it. Now, they read the dozen pages and they were laughing. I knew I was writing a funny play, I did not realize it was that funny. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, I said you know you guys are joking you know because I have written it. They said no, look this is funny you know I know this uh, guy uh, you know I know the kind of arguments he has with his dad and uh, you know we know these people and they said let us do this play you know. I said yes ok let us do it. So, the next question is where is the rest of it? You know, I said there, there is no rest of it. That's all I have. You know, and then my friend said, "Why don't you just shut up and go home and write the play, and we'll do it." And I said, "Okay." 
I remember we started rehearsals and I'd only written the first act, right? And in the play, if you know, there's another character who comes in the second act, who's not there in the first act. So we had all these teething problems, is that we'd begun rehearsals without a complete play, uh, which again was, uh, uh, you know, unheard of uh, at that time. Uh, the fact that you're working on a new script, a new play, uh, uh, you know, which has never seen a production before, uh, which didn't have some kind of a connection with, uh, with the West. Uh, uh, to us in Bangalore, in English uh, language, uh, convent educated uh, pretentious creatures that we were, uh, it just didn't uh, uh, have any kind of uh, precedence. So, we did the play and the audiences suddenly who were normally for our plays would sit back, arms folded and say okay and then you know give you a very sort of mild applause at the end of it and then go away planning their dinners and uh, you know uh, uh, not calling because that, that uh, those days we didn't have cell phones. Uh, so these the, the very same audiences were guffawing and they were applauding, not because it's a brilliant play, but because they could identify, suddenly they could relate to these characters, they could say that's my dad on stage, or they could say that's me over there, or you know that's my mom, you know, or, uh, you know that's my husband, that's exactly the way he speaks, right, uh, that's exactly the tone he takes when, when uh, he's irritated, and uh, things like that. So people could identify with the situations and they could identify with those characters and we were suddenly flooded with people backstage saying that thank God you know that you've come up with this, we're sick and tired of those Neil Simon comedies and those false, uh, those pretentious accents that you actors tend to uh, do when you're doing an American play and stuff like that. And you know in a way I did realize it but uh, like the child who says you know when the emperor thinks that he has clothes, fine clothes but he's actually naked and everyone just goes along and says yeah yeah you look wonderful and this little child says but he's naked you know and I think that's uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of um, strange and naive way, I, I was doing the same thing with Indian, uh, with English language theatre is saying that it really has no substance. Uh, so, uh, that's how I began writing and uh, of course today I'm more known as a writer and that's why the question always comes up, why do you write plays and why not novels? Uh, and also the, the thing is that I would like to also give you a, a, a slight uh, differentiation between writing for, uh, uh, writing a dramatic script and writing a novel is that there's a reason why we're called playwrights, W-R-I-G-H-T-S, right, we're not, we're very rarely called writers, like a uh, right is a craftsman, like a uh, wheelwright, uh, a smith, uh, a smith. So, uh, it's the craft of uh, writing for the theatre, uh, which is hugely important when you're writing a play. Uh, yes, of course, it's creative, it's subjective, uh, but the subjectivity comes in content in characterization, etc. But there is a certain machinery in place, how a play plays out from moment to moment. Uh, one example I could give is in music, you have a certain temporal machinery in place, like if you have a scale, then that is, those are the notes on the ascending scale, those are the notes on the descending scale and you play with those notes, right. There are only seven notes, but imagine the wealth of music that's, that we've, we have over these thousands of years, right. It's the same with, with, uh, with uh, dramatic structure. Basically you have conflict and you have the two universal plots of comedy and tragedy and everything in between and you create, uh, you know, infinite varieties of uh, Again, that's a quote from Shakespeare. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, uh, you, you, you can, you, can, uh, you know, uh, the combinations are endless, just as human faces, right? Like as a face, we all have two eyes, a nose, two ears, lips, right? Cheekbones, right? All of us 
billions and billions of people and yet each face is unique, right? That is the same thing about writing, is that you use the, you know, the few alphabets, the, the consonants and the vowels, that is what you have, you create words and speech etcetera, etcetera, but what you create is, is a multitude of, um, of works that live on and on and that is the magic of the theatre and that is the magic of <coughs> writing, right. So, now coming to my book, I have a book to sell, but unfortunately I do not have the books, thanks to my publisher Penguin. Uh, this is the only copy in all of Hyderabad today and it was meant to be a book release and uh, actually I, I uh, uh, you know this was meant to be Professor <laughs> Anand, uh, Anand Krishna's copy and I had to snatch it back from him to say I need it to read, but I assure you I will give it because I do want you to have it. <laughs> so, in this uh, there are two of my new plays which, which have never been published, but have been performed. One is called Where Did I Leave My Parda and the second is called The Big Fat City. The second one is what I call a black comedy, uh, because uh, black comedy is, uh, is a genre where uh, there is humour employed, uh, but uh, you know it is used uh, to explore very, very serious and tragic uh, uh, incidents, which normally we do not associate humour with. For example, deaths, right. Uh, or uh, you know uh, maybe um, uh, a parent child relationship, uh, these are the things we take very very seriously and a black comedy tends to make, uh, 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 make fun of it. But the idea is not to trivialize these subjects, but actually to help us think a little deeper about them. Uh, that when you have the distance that a good comedy offers you, uh, you, you can actually reflect upon it uh, a, a little better. The theatre, how many theatre students are over here? Ah, good, one, two, three, four, brilliant, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So, what I am saying makes sense to you? Okay, if it does not, you are welcome to say so, yeah. Also in this book is an essay called Me and My Plays and it talks about some of the things I just sort of mentioned to you. And I will read an excerpt, a very, very short excerpt from it, right from the beginning. And uh, then we can op uh, open it out to questions and I will, uh, you know, request better people to come on stage and, uh, you know, uh, question me. Bangalore in the 60s was considered a pensioner's paradise. It was indeed a paradise of sorts with its salubrious weather, quiet roads and friendly people. There were pockets in the city that housed communities that had migrated from the north of the Vindhyas. We never did fit into that upwardly mobile wealth showing community of Gujaratis and we rarely socialized as families. So, it was always an exciting day when we received the community newsletter that occasionally updated us on festival events or deaths and ever so occasionally announced the staging of a Gujarati play at the town hall. My father used to talk very fondly of his days in Bombay as it was called then before it changed to Mumbai in the 90s, when he would visit the theatres at Bhangwadi to see Gujarati musical drama near the city's notorious Opium Bazaar. He should talk about, he would talk about legends like Moti Bai, Mishama Bai and comedian Chagan Romeo, all of whom were stars with a faithful following performances would go on for hours longer than scheduled because of the cries of once more, once more, which led to popular song routines being replayed sometimes almost a dozen times. But all this was just a fairy tale to me, as real as the stories in Chanda Mama that my sister Padma would read out from when I was a child. I must have been about nine years old when I got to see the real thing. It was at the town hall in Bangalore. It seemed so grand in those days with its Roman columns, majestic arches and corridors. I remember the Gujarati community well turned out in their safari suits and American Georgette saris. My mother was probably the most excited of all of us meeting old friends from her hometown. The banter was invariably about weddings wedding plans and prospective brides and grooms. 
The men talked only about business and the Africa returned traders always lauded it over the rest. The shrill bell announcing the start of the play could just about be heard over the loud voices in the foyer and it did little to cut short the chatter. When even the third bell could not succeed in getting people to move from the foyer into the hall, the local sponsors resorted to desperate pleas imploring people to go inside so that they could start the play. Inside, the decibel levels did not diminish. In fact, they grew even stronger as people called out to friends across the hall. Class divides were clearly drawn with the local sponsors getting front row seats while the rest of us got whatever came to us, scurrying for seats near the fans. The announcements commenced with requests to keep silent and take crying infants out of the auditorium and then the play began. After the initial awe of seeing real people on stage, unlike in the movies, I was struck by the loud voices of the actors and their loud costumes. It was a play about well-off Gujaratis. Yes, the women wore Georgette and there was a character who had returned from Africa. The woman was meeting her lover secretly at home, but the husband returned a little early. There was laughter in the house, which died down soon after the husband brought out a gun. I was transfixed by how the mere appearance of the weapon changed the tone of the play entirely. There were sharp intakes of breath as the gun was passed around. The very air crackled with tension. It was clear to all of us, including me with my virgin sense of dramaturgy, that the gun would go off at some point. At one light moment in the play, the gun came to the actress who, turning around to the audience, shot at a man in the front row. Bang! The man fell off his seat after a loud cry and was rushed out of the hall. It was only once the house lights came on as the curtains fell that I became aware once again that I was in a hall with a thousand people. There was a palpable silence in the hall before the murmurs picked up again. Only this time they were talking about the play, especially the twist before the interval. They were keen to know what would happen next. I was fascinated not only by the plot, but also the effect the play had on its audience. If something like this could shut the mouths of a thousand Gujaratis, I had to be a part of this magic. This was indeed the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Thank you. And now I welcome. So, I am a, I am Akshat. I am a first year theater student. And uh, so I have, like, I must first confess before I ask my question that I haven't read any of your plays. But there are so many playwrights before you who I am going through. And there are better playwrights. No, I should read them. So, and to redeem myself, I would say I am following you on Facebook. So, ah. <laughs> so I have two questions. Uh, I have always felt that writing for the dialogue is always difficult. Like you have to say everything through the dialogue. You, so if you can elaborate on how different or how difficult it is uh, to write for the dialogues vis-a-vis -vis other mediums. And my second question is, I have seen young theatre practitioners working, creating their own material. As you said that you started working with ready-made plays. So, how important do you think is to start with ready-made plays if you believe in it? And if you think the same way. And so yeah, if you can just comment. First of all, very uh, uh, pertinent questions. The first is that how difficult or how easy it is to write dialogue. Uh, now, this is where I would like to, uh, uh, there are assumptions about dialogue which needs to be broken. One is that you say it all in dialogue, that you tell your story in dialogue. I think the focus should be how difficult is it for uh, to, to play out your characters, that your characters live in action. You can have a play without dialogue, but you can't have a play without action, right? So your characters want something and they act upon their want. That's why it's called acting or action. That's where the word comes from. And 
yes, I agree that dialogue writing is a craft and requires a great deal of experience to get it right. But many people believe that dialogue is expository, that it is it's there to tell the audience what the character is thinking. But very often dialogue, good dialogue helps you understand what the character is not saying uh, or wants to do, but is not doing. Uh, so, I think good text offers you subtext and I think good text gives you silences where subtext can become very articulate as well. So, that is a hugely complicated process, but it can be very, very organic. I think you, you can draw upon your natural ability to write dialogue if you just keep the focus on character. You know, one of the things is that dialogue emerges from character. I am saying who, what I am saying because of who I am. It is not the other way around that because I say something that is who I am, right. So, that is uh, very important, right. And as far as your second uh, uh, question, yes, you can have theatre without a script, right. Uh, it is possible to do that, but you cannot have theatre without a performer and an audience. You need at least one performer and one audience for theatre to take place, right. Now, the way theatre has evolved, right, uh, the text based drama, uh, that is what uh, we are concerned about, and that is where I find my job, you know. But I have to admit that I have done improvisations with actors and uh, uh, quite a lot of power uh, uh, at spontaneity comes through when uh, actors are given uh, the space to improvise. And I think that is a very dynamic form of theatre which is uh, which has always been there, but it is growing in popularity now. And I think that is a great way uh, working with young adults and children as well, is not to give them this sort of script and force them into uh, you know uh, uh, adhering to a script, because that kills all creativity and spontaneity amongst children. I think improvising and there is a technique in that it is not as easy as it sounds, but it is great fun. Uh, for the actors and it frees them you know in a very creative way. So, I think uh, sometimes good text comes out of improvisations, uh, which means that the improvisation happens and then it is transcribed as a text. Uh, so, that is also possible. Yeah. The second question was uh, you started with ready made plays already. Yeah. Yeah. So, how important do you think uh, is it as uh, the training? Uh, for uh, your, uh, for a theatre person to start with ready made plays and how did it, uh, how did your theatre evolve out of it? Mm -hmm. uh, that was your second question. Was that your question? Okay. Well, my theatre evolved from text based drama because that is the kind of uh, drama I was introduced to earlier on in my life and that continued for a very long time till I travelled a bit and saw different kinds of uh, performance pieces and things. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the, uh, you know you cannot uh, undermine, I am not undermining uh, the importance of uh, text based drama as a way of uh, training the actor, you know and then the actor has the choice. Uh, you could do Shakespeare. Uh, you or you you could do a complete performance piece which is uh, which is based on improvisations uh, so uh, it should come out of choice not because you can't do one uh, uh, it shouldn't be like some actors may be so bound by text based theater that they can't do improvisations and some only work with improvisations and cannot approach text based uh, theater because they don't understand text so there is a craft in understanding text as well. Uh, you know, there is script analysis and the, these are areas which as drama students you will definitely have to study. Uh, and of course, there is uh, the uh, uh, you know the techniques, various techniques of improvisations and methods of improvisation and character and characterization. There is you know the method, the Stanislavski one and then there is the Chekhovian one and blah, blah, blah. So, you, you know what I am talking about. So, uh, I, I think uh, the bottom line is you cannot undermine the importance of training. 
uh, there's just this misnomer and we were just talking about this is that you know if you want to study music you will learn the basic uh, scales and you will learn your uh, you know sarle varse and janti varse and then from there you will move on to simple ragas and then you'll go on to complicated ragas you are willing to spend 6 7 years learning that if you're learning dance you will start with your simple adavus and you know getting your aramandi right and then taiya 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 tam and then go to ta 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 then move on to jati swarams and then you do your alaripu and then you do your arange and so you're willing to spend 10 years learning that but theater everyone thinks they could just wake up one day and play hamlet right so uh, that is uh, uh, you, you know that is something because theaters uh, the craft in the theater is invisible you know when you see performers do things with such ease you feel that what's there you know anyone can do that no that's not there there is a great deal of craft that goes into making it appear as if there is uh, 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 there is no craft visible um i'm radhikaran doing my phd here in theater arts i would like to know your writing process um uh, how and where the idea germinal idea comes in your mind uh, with the character or image or uh, situations <laughs> i would like to know that yeah uh, again it's a very complicated uh, uh, answer to that is what is my process right uh, all i could say is that i do not have a fixed process and i feel that uh, yes there is uh, you know, there is i'm sure there is some method uh, in that uh, uh, madness Uh, again to quote uh, shakespeare uh, but uh, you mentioned characters uh, uh, you, you know situations and i think ultimately whatever the germ of the idea whether it's a situation or whether it's a conversation that i've overheard or whatever if i can't bring it down to characters uh, if the characters don't somehow live in my mind i don't think i would then have the uh creative stamina uh, to uh, to uh, complete the play uh, to write it in completion uh so i uh, for me the characters need to come very vividly uh, uh you know and uh, what are they what are they doing something as simple as that that's what i would ask myself uh, as to what 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 are my characters doing uh and uh that would i think lead to other questions as well so i ask myself uh, questions and that sort of helps me enter the world of my characters a little it's very in, uh, important to gain that sort of entry into this charmed inner space uh, that your characters live in uh, because until you do that uh, i don't think you could really write uh, write that play and i'm sure that's true of novel writing as well uh that uh, you know it's uh, it's it's an entry into a world which has some sense of reality but is actually a a, a creation of your imagination as well to ask you uh, even business about writing in english do you find that writing in english somehow is limiting uh, you know because you said you uh, told everybody not to send their kids to english mm-hmm. medium schools mm-hmm. Okay, so let me put the question uh, the right way around. Mm. Do you find somehow that the range of subjects or the range of characters that you can write about in your plays is limited beyond where you would? Yeah. Comfortable? Well, uh, I think it's uh, when I said that, and uh, even in my essay, I've talked about being doomed as an Indian English writer. I I think it's more to do with culture because language and culture are completely connected. Uh in fact language emerges from culture. So where do, does our English emerge from? That is the question which uh, which then becomes like you you immediately become cultural orphans because you've actually come from a complete void. And uh you know there is a sense of cultivation over there. Uh, uh which uh, which seems a little forced maybe at times uh because it's not really from the soil uh the cultivation also where does that come from what are we reaping you know so the only analogy i could think of is that if we're talking about rootedness which is what 
you, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you operate in a language that comes from your culture, uh, then you are looking at leaves and you are looking at uh, blooms, you are looking at uh, you know, foliage coming out uh, from those roots. Right? But I think the only way I could, uh, I could liberate myself is by saying that I am actually a bird on that tree, that I do not have roots. And the advantage I have is that I can fly. Uh, and I think that may be the advantage I have uh, 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 writing in English is that I can fly, uh, that I do not necessarily owe allegiance to my roots in that sense. Uh, that may be seen as an excuse as it is by some, uh, but uh, that is the only sort of poetic justification I can give uh, for writing in English. I am Indra, who worked in Madras University. I started uh, the theatre portion of our English department and uh, requested the Madras University to use the Tagore Fellowship and funding uh -huh. to just create a theatre professor. So, we have of course put your plays in our syllabi and uh, you were talking about the alienation that happens uh, if you write in English, that was uh, the Vice Chancellor's question and uh, uh, you were almost apologetic or some, you are uh, in some way trying to say that uh, you were alienated from your roots and culture. However, there is another kind of alienation possible in, uh, in Chennai as you would know, you, know, you have different kinds of theatre. One is uh, the native theatre of uh, Kutupattare, mm. which uh, Nam Muthuswami has yeah, founded. I've and, uh, seen that. Yeah. yeah, and uh, uh, Mr. Anmol Velani of uh, India Arts Foundation has directed uh, some of his plays and uh, has also translated his Ingirandi, which was uh, performed in Alliance France and so on. In, in such plays, the alienation for what you may call the middle class regular audience takes place even though they are Tamil speaking people. Mm -hmm. Because something has happened to the way theatre employs itself as a critique of what's happening. Because in your place, for instance, when you talk about violence or Hindu-Muslim conflict and so on, I'm not a scholar like uh, Tutun Mukherjee, but I just have some simple ideas about uh, uh, what you're doing. So when such things are uh, dramatized, he uses, almost, he creates almost a different kind of grammar of representation. Absolutely. Uh, as Chandralekha did it for uh, Yes. Uh, dance and performance. Yeah. See, he almost completely altered. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have all Kalari, Payatu and all that, you see. And then the way England is a kind of a critique of colonialism and our fascination for English. And then how we come out of it to the post colonial, <coughs> post modern India. That mm -hmm. is the whole play. But uh, the people who watch that play must be extremely trained. Otherwise, you may feel happy that our students might understand your play better mm -hmm. than probably. Uh, Muthami's plays. Ah. I'm not saying that as a negative point because he's an extremely. I know. Uh, I mean, the yeah, work is brilliant. Cultural artist, yes, and even absolutely. as uh, your milieu yeah. has its own roots and justification. He has mil his milieu, which comes from Tanjavur background, and he has drawn from several native theatre. Plus, he has added it, added to it is a number of other aspects of uh, what I may call theatre grammar. Mm -hmm. And so, I feel that. Uh, in any case, theatre can create some degree of alienation and of that course. was probably necessary as yeah. Brett thought. Of Absolutely, because what we are talking about is an aesthetic or psychological distance, right? And that is the kind of work that Kutupatra is known for. Uh, just for people who do not know, it is a theatre group in Chennai. I do not know whether they have an equivalent over here in Andhra, uh, where uh, you, you know uh, uh, the theatre is representational in the sense that uh, uh, it speaks through a certain codified language of theatre, which means then that you do not sort of get involved in, uh, in uh, what is going to happen next the way you would in a soap opera. But I think the antithesis of that would I would say is uh, the television serial soap opera, where you are so uh, you know uh, Tulsi is going to now you know pounce on this little girl and uh, you know uh, I do not know eat her up or I, I do not know I am just making it up I, uh, I do not know. And then you you are one you know what is she going to do oh my god she is pregnant and my god oh my god but her husband was away in America for, for two years oh my god how will when will he find out oh my god what will she do oh my god she should have an abortion no no no, no. oh my god you know. So that is what the uh, TV serial does is that it appeals to your basest uh, uh, sense of curiosity 
not curiosity so much as voyeurism. Basically, you are you are looking at other people's uh, uh, you know misfortunes and feeling good about yourself. <laughs> well, well, that's <laughs> that's what it does. Uh, whereas this this theatre of a alienation was precisely that. I mean, I know people uh, sort of attribute it to Brecht, but you can actually see it in Indian traditional Indian theatre. I mean, all Indian theatre is epic in that sense, isn't it? Uh, so anyway, Professor Mukherjee can wax eloquent on that. Uh, so uh, that is a different kind of alienation. What I am talking about is uh, is cul cultural orphanage that is the only thing I could think of and if you feel that in urban areas that more people identify with my work it is because there are more cultural orphans in the cities. In the cities most of us are in some way uh, you know either cultural orphans or uh, uh, the equivalent of uh, you know being brought up by single parents uh, because we do give up uh, uh, a lot of our rootedness uh, because the urban lifestyle demands it right and we we've got to let go of a lot of things this need not be a negative thing it could be a positive thing as well uh, uh, in fact let's leave the negative and positive aside uh, but the fact is that this sense of um, uh, 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 displacement which is a word again which is as often used as uh, uh, any other uh, you, you, you know all of us in the cities uh, face that uh, in some form or another you know either through gender or uh, you know through sexuality or through lifestyle choices versus traditional uh, lifestyle choices or whatever and maybe that is probably the reason why those subjects sort of find uh, are grist to the mill for me. Uh, uh, that I employ those subjects because maybe they speak better to me and to my audiences as well. Hi, um, my name is Mary. I'm um, a music major, theater minor. Um, I just had a question, kind of cliche, but um, so where, like, where do you get your inspiration from when you're writing your plays and like developing your characters in the plot? Like, do you pull it from like real life experiences or just completely fictional, or mm -hmm. where do you? Here. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's a bit of both, really. It's hard for me to say. Like, for example, uh, Tara, which is a play about conjoined twins who are separated, and it's it's actually a separation of genders, etc. That uh, actually the the plot at uh, the metaphor of conjoinment came from a medical journal, you know, something I read, uh, right? And then I looked at the possibilities and stuff. And then another play of mine, I overheard a conversation. And it actually, uh, you know, the entire play was built from that. Uh, but in all, I think one thing is that in all of them, it just I did just pluck it off uh, out of my head uh, that something, uh, you know, in my environment uh, sort of evoked this response, and then that response then sort of germinated uh, the the play. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you know. Maybe I didn't answer that uh, earlier because there was a similar question asked earlier. <laughs> is that I would feel that it's my sense of reality or uh, or where my gaze is, and my sense of imagination. I, I think when the two meet, that's when I think uh, I I feel that a play might ripen out of it. <laughs> Sir. Yes. You plays frequently make use of classical music, be it Eastern classical as Nana Devi or Western as in Brahms. Uh, could you please elaborate on this angle? Ah, okay. yeah. Well, I really uh, I like music because I think music can uh, articulate emotions. Uh, I think far better than words can. I know actors would disagree with me saying that the human voice is perfectly capable, human speech is perfectly capable of articulating emotions, but I think music does it in a, in a more transcendental way. I think music uh, is perhaps uh, uh, the most expressive. Uh, maybe again dancers might disagree, so I do not want to g get into that. Uh, but uh, in my plays specifically, like at Tara, I felt that the, the, there is so much conflict uh, in the lives of the two, uh, the twins and uh, there is so little said about it. 
uh, that I feel that when he listens to the showy opening of Brahms first concerto and he talks about it that in some way he is talking about his uh, virtuosity coming through in all that grandness and showingness and stuff like that and I think he can only sort of articulate what he is feeling uh, when he is listening to the music. And even later on in the scene when uh, he's all alone with Rupa, he's lis listening to uh, uh, Chopin's et etude. And uh, even there, uh, he's listening to uh, this, um, uh, uh, I think he was Polish, uh, Dinu Lepati, was he Polish? I don't know. Um, uh, he, he was dying, uh, he had cancer, and he, uh, and, but he was still performing his music. Uh, so they say that somehow, the, the sort of the fact that he uh, he was losing his life sort of played out in the music. So uh, he says, you know, you know, I'm going to use his Dino Lepati's version, and uh, we know that they're dying. Uh, so in that sense, that sort of just sort of says it all, uh, and I think that expresses it better. Now, when bravely fought the queen, uh, and even in my film Morning Raga. I use in Morning Raga, of course, I used Carnatic music. By the way, I shot it in Hyderabad and Rajmandri, uh, so uh, you guys may be interested in seeing it. You were probably kids when it was first. Um, it's a film about this Carnatic uh, uh, singer. Has anyone seen the film? Oh, not bad. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. So uh, and then when uh, when she actually crosses the bridge and performs it at a concert, that is when she achieves fulfillment, right. Now, the concert raga is probably the most complex one, you know, and for you to achieve that, uh, there is a sense of accomplishment. So, I use that as a metaphor for her to come to terms with a lot of things that go on in her life, the loss of her child, etc. And you know, that is what she is actually, that is what the story is about. So, in that sense, yes, uh, 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 you know, the, the choice of music there is a part of the storytelling. That uh, you talked about dialogue, I think these are ways where you could tell the story even more effectively than just, just through the words that the characters are speaking. In fact, I would say that more than the words, it is everything else that is around the words, including the silences. I think those make more meaning. So, what if uh, I'm, I would like to respond to the debates over uh, the usage of English language in your plays. Uh, my sojourn with your plays began with Tara and I loved it a lot. So, uh, and uh, your plays are uh, realistic. There are a lot of uh, social and uh, problematic issues highlighted. You always uh, tend to bring out and uh, raise issues which are normally placed under the rug in the society. People don't really talk about them and so on. So, the way you treat uh, the, uh, the colonial language, I mean now it is our own language, the English language in, a pr in pretty realistic ways because uh, there is a, a character called Mali in the play Do the Needful. So, he, uh, he never understands a single word spoken in English. He responds to the gestures. Mm -hmm. So, in that respect, uh, the, the play is very realistic because we cannot expect a Mali to speak fluently in English or so. Then there is another play called, uh, yeah, Maggi Night in Mumbai, where the Bahadur speaks a lot of colloquial Hindi. So, that also shows that all the characters do not speak very high fi English, the ethos of the Indian society where everybody does not know, know English properly, everything is highlighted in quite possible ways. Mm. So, that is my response to, uh, I mean the debates about your place being only in English, mm. because you are quite uh, easy and you, you, you know what you are doing. The characters who are not supposed to, <laughs> <laughs> because the characters uh, who are not supposed to have a very high fi education not placed on, uh, on the creamy layers of the society do not speak English in your place. Mm -hmm. So, that is my response and as far as the uh, question is concerned, um, like you, you yourself agree that your plays are very, very mobile in the sense uh, that you give the performer, performers the freedom 
to act out and make uh, improvisations. So uh, when I read Tara, I was uh, I was very confused in the beginning. I had to read it three times to understand it perfectly well. Um, oh, the set, three times. <laughs> <laughs> it's a multi-level yeah. set, and uh, Doctor Thakkar is made to. Uh, I mean, he is like sitting on the top level. Yeah like a presiding deity, yeah. watching all the errors which has come out of his own hands. That's true. Excellent interpretation. Yeah. So uh, when we, as, uh, I mean, uh, we are not from theatre, we are from the Department of English. We read your plays and imagine the theatricality on our part. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the theatre the moves in our brains at that time. So when we enact this play, can we make it, I mean, how, how will we make Dr. Thakkar, the presiding deity, sit on the theatre, I mean on the stage? Like how he's sitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's, that's how at least uh, I've, I've directed two productions of Tara. Alec Padabsi has directed one and there have been several college productions and sometimes they send me pictures. And it's usually uh, Dr. Tucker, there's this high level at the back and he's seated on this chair which looks like a throne, you know. So, and he's seated there very pompous talking about the separation and saying, oh, we had the surgery done and we had to make sure the bile ducts are not damaged and, you know, of course this and, you know, ha ha ha, nature, you know, didn't do a good job, but we completed it for her, ha ha, you know. So, there, there's that whole sort of uh, air of, uh, you know, being the controller of what's going on. So, I think that's uh, part of the set design and it would be very um, interesting to see a group do it a little differently and yet give us the sense of his stature in society as someone almost the equivalent of God. Uh, so, uh, that's, that's ultimately that's the purpose. How it is done, uh, there are, there, I'm sure there are plenty of creative possibilities, but the way I've written it, he's on the highest level right at the back, up center, sort of looking uh, 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 out at uh, uh, the other characters and including the audience. Uh, hello, uh, yeah. I'm from School of Social Science. I'm not belonging to any theatre, drama, literature, but I have special interest in it. So we all agree uh, that uh, art is a reflection of society, um, both past and present. Okay, I think its innovation uh, sometimes has to catch up to society, but it leads society too. It just came with ideas uh, about something we want to say about something they want to tell someone, okay? And uh, it's, a, it's a form of communication, and that communication, the stories which come from uh, society, uh, not just uh, where society is presently and what it's doing now, uh, but where the society has been, okay? It creates a debate, mm -hmm. uh, conversation, interaction, and an atmosphere uh, to acquire knowledge and wisdom. Okay, it's a powerful vehicle for culture, education, leisure, and propaganda. So, it's a very general question of uh, why the Indian filmmakers um, uh, were very reluctant to take uh, the socio-economic issues like slavery, bondage, migration, trafficking in the film. Why they should not take a stand, a position on that topic, and we can debate. Yeah. Okay, how many of you would see a mainstream film if it was about slavery and bondage and dowry and uh, child sexual abuse? How many would see it? One, maybe like this. There are a couple of liars, uh, there are a couple of, okay, so not many. You, you see, the film industry do not treat, uh, we talked about art as communication, right? Now, what the film industry is communicating with is the audience's wallet. That's, that's what they want to have a dialogue with as to how to get that because it's completely driven by commerce. And they're very honest about it. One has to give them credit for that, right? So, what they want to do is they cannot afford to rub the audiences. They cannot make the audience, uh, they don't want to challenge the audience because we as a culture do not like being challenged, right? So, what they're saying is that whatever values you believe in, go ahead, beat up your wives, 
you know, treat your servants like rubbish, you are fine, you know, you are great, you know, and this is what we are and we are great people and this is what we believe in, in the sense that they want to stroke their audience, they do not want to poke their audience, right. So, that is what they are driven and that is why it will always be, uh, you know, about rich people who have all the time in the world to fall in love and they do and then the conflict is of course, so sort of uh, 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 superficial that it is like oh no, here is dad, you know and then dad has to somehow separate them and then reunite them etcetera, right. So, it sort of appeals to a very basic need uh, for um, getting away from uh, what we think of as problems, right. But in, it, in doing so, actually it defeats the purpose, that the more you run away, the, the, the more uh, uh, you cannot handle those problems and you want to run away further. So, which means that that is what the uh, Indian uh, film industry caters to is that come to us and we will take you to this world where everything is alright and uh, 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 you, you, you know there, there is laughter, there is colours, there is you know music, there is everything and uh, uh, forget your own lives for a while for two hours and uh, you will be happy. So, that is what they offer, right. So, in that sense to expect a deeper communication uh, from that industry uh, is futile, right. But I am glad you brought that up that art is communication in that sense that uh, you know it is not self indulgence. Uh, again that is a social perception that all artists are self indulgent people and that we live according to our whims and fancies, right. And uh, that is what our lives, in fact it is just the other way around. I feel that as people who who are in pursuit of material acquisitions, they are the ones who, who live on their whims and fancies and are disconnected with society. Art is truly about communication on very deep levels, on layers and things. Sir, uh, coming back to uh, your creative process, you talked about how it is germinates when you read something and things like that. I was wondering how it is uh, different <coughs> when a work is commissioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially work like 13 days in September. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether the creative process is different in that case. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it has to arrive at that process, right. I will give you an example Final Solutions was commissioned, right. In the sense, Alec Padamsi approached me, and this was much before the Babri Masjid, uh, 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 you, you, you know. Uh, 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 when uh, they raised down the Babri Masjid, this was in the late uh, 80s when this Ram Janma Bhumi was an issue in the parliament, right. And he said, why do not you write about this, because I see this as what he called a pogrom, like Hitler's uh, pogrom that uh, you know annihilation. So, uh, you know these guys are looking at ethnic cleansing, whatever it takes to get the majority vote, right. I did not understand what he was talking about. And I said, I really can't write about Hindu Muslim conflicts. What are we going to say, Hindu Muslim? Bye bye. You know, it, it just doesn't. And he, of course, you know, being my mentor, could see how um, superficial my response was to that. And he actually arranged for his actors to do an improvisation. In that improvisation, uh, there were these two Muslim boys who were running away from a mob who could get killed if they remain on the streets. And so, they seek shelter in a house which happens to be a very conservative Hindu household, right. And then the dynamics of that encounter, uh, suddenly I, I could see the possibilities, right. And so, if I could not see the possibilities, I have a choice, either I accept the commission because I need the money and come up with something very superficial or I reject it and say I cannot do this because it does not excite me, right. Those are the choices I have. So, in that sense uh, a commission can also be uh, uh, an interesting way for you to get inspired and uh, to write on something that may not be in your comfort zone. Yeah, I was actually wondering about the uh, 
about uh, uh, the 13 days in September. Yes. Yeah. So that I was also commissioned. You're right. Yeah. So I was wondering that uh, did, uh, did it in any way limit the way to approach the issue or how? Yeah. Well, uh, see, uh, 30 days in September, which is a play about child sexual abuse. Oh, it was staged here. Who staged it? These actors? No. Ah, okay. Good. Oh, yes. He's right here. Okay. I didn't know that. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely delighted to meet you. I, I saw your play um, on, um, uh, 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 yes, on. Um, Ekalavia, yes, that's right. Yeah, brilliant play. Uh, that's a play which was commissioned. You are absolutely right. This NGO uh, in Delhi, uh, who counsel uh, uh, survivors of child sexual abuse, they approached me and said, "Can you write a play about uh, uh, child sexual abuse?" And I immediately said yes. Unlike uh, Final Solutions, where I was hemming and hawing, etc., uh, because immediately I could see how relevant it is uh, to uh, our society. And uh, for, uh, I had the, uh, uh, the good fortune of being able to talk to uh, uh, seven or eight survivors of childhood sexual abuse, uh, who were in various process stages of healing and were very, very articulate and willing to talk ab about their experiences and their traumas. And uh, the play is a result of several of their stories sort of put together and uh, it was of course uh, quite, a, quite a learning experience for me. Um, but at the same time, I could understand uh, you, you know, how traumatic it must be to, to have your whole being violated at such a young age when you know, you're, you're seeking love and uh, 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 you know, uh, protection from adults. And the, that very adult can violate you so, uh, 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 so uh, uh, you know, in, in such an extreme fashion. Um, that was very uh, uh, sort of um, moving and uh, 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 you know, inspiring for me. And that's where, when, I, uh, uh, when I sat down. It took me about a year after those interviews that I had with the survivors to actually write the play. Uh, mention other uh, forms like the novel and poetry. In novel and poetry, both we can see there is a probability on the part of the author to keep his presence felt on throughout the work or in some places put in authorial comments. But in, especially in, kind of in the terms of plays, when you are writing a play, you literally have to let your characters do the talking. So, whatever you have to say, is there a deliberate part on the attempt on the part of the author to efface himself to some extent um, when he's writing a play, and uh, is there an attempt to also limit the author's um, use of rhetoric and language, keeping in mind the character he's trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you see, in uh, that's why I said a playwright is more of a craftsman than a writer. Right? Because a writer can afford to have this third person uh, in the story. Uh, you know, uh, you could have a novel that says, Scarlett O'Hara was not attractive. Right? Now, who is saying that? Who finds her not attractive? It's the author's voice. Right? She's saying that she wasn't attractive, but men seldom realized it when caught uh, you know, by her charms or whatever, and so on and so forth. Right? Now, that's the language of the novel. In the novel, there is a third person involved. Of course, you could still uh, have novels. There are brilliant novels written in the first person, uh, but still, in in a sense, uh, you you can the, the author's voice does make its presence uh, felt. Um, whereas theatre is about multiple perspectives, right? Uh, for example, uh, you know why a play like uh, Ekalavia, the one I saw, was so important is that it offers a completely different perspective that we do not normally see in our social understanding of the story of Ekalavia. Because it was written as poetry, poetic narration, uh, it had the third person in the sense, and the third person being someone of an upper caste, uh, of a certain privilege, uh, who says, that uh, in a way, in a crafty way is telling us that Ekalavya did not deserve to be the finest archer in the world. And uh, so, 
uh, Dronacharya was completely right in asking him for his thumb. Uh, uh, you never question his motives in the story, the way it is told traditionally. Right? In this play, you have a completely different perspective and that is Ekalavya's perspective. Of course, if he wants to be the, the world's greatest uh, archer, he is going to be disappointed. Why should he give away his thumb? You know, what a stupid thing to do. You know? w would you do that? I mean, if you want to be uh, uh, you know, a brilliant scientist. Uh, would you give away, uh, 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 you know, part of your experience because the teacher asks you to? So, in that sense, uh, that's what good theatre does: is that it offers you multiple perspectives. And yes, the playwright and the director have uh, the uh, choice of focusing or accenting a particular perspective. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Taming of the Shrew, Shakespeare, right? Now, uh, as the name suggests, it's, he wrote it as this uh, uh, drama about this uh, very wild woman who needed to be taught a lesson. And of course, there is the macho man who is going to put her in a place, get her to kiss him, and she will be his lawful and obedient uh, uh, wife for the rest of her life, right? Now, today, if you interpreted it that way, you will be laughed off the stage. They will say, what a stupid interpretation. Today, you have to show Kate as a victim. It is about a free woman and the tragedy of that freedom being lost because she has to uh, uh, give in to male power. Right? So, that is uh, that's interpretation, that is another perspective and that is why the play is so great because it offers these multiple perspectives. So, that is the language of theatre and it is this entire business about the author, where is the author then and where, where is his uh, uh, rhetoric and where is his uh, rubbish, it is about art, it is not about a person. And if you really want to, uh, you know, pats on your back to say, look how skillful I am as a writer, then, then uh, you know, write, uh, uh, write something else, do not write a play. Because in the play, uh, the playwright has to be invisible. If the playwright is visible, then it is a, it's a bad play. I just wanted to ask, say, that, uh, like most of the contemporary writers, they are using uh, very frequently these F, F words and the slangs, which are like uh, so-called slangs, uh, the F words. Ah. Uh, so, my question is to you like uh, how does it bear the significance or what significance uh, does it have? Okay, do you use F letter words with your friends? Tell the truth, hand on heart. Yes, you do. So, why do not you want to see it on stage? That is exactly what the theatre does, is that it puts on stage the things that we do, but do not want to talk about. Right? So, that is the, the beauty of theatre, is that like she said that you know things that society sweeps under the rug, right? We tend to dust it to the audience, this is you, you know, take your dust. <laughs>